Glory to God. Well, I want to welcome everyone to our Bible study, our study of God's Word. And that's what we're doing. We're studying His Word. We're not reading His Word. We're studying His Word. And in doing that, we get something that God has promised us. We get a greater knowledge of Him. And it's all of these great and precious promises that are attached to gaining the knowledge of God our Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the way we gain knowledge of our Father is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? So if you get a knowledge of me and of the Lord Jesus Christ, all these great blessings will come. So how do I get a knowledge of the Father? Through Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we don't have two separate that we need to get a knowledge of. You understand that? He said, me and my Father are one. And that's really what we were talking about Sunday in regards to faith. We've been studying faith, the who, what, why, where, when, and how of faith. We're going to continue to study this until the Holy Spirit tells us to move on. But we're studying our offering confession of faith. And the reason the Holy Spirit, I believe, inspired me to teach on this is because He wants us to manifest what we're confessing. So we're not just a show with no power behind it, nothing behind it, just, just a show. He wants us to demonstrate. Isn't that our vision? To demonstrate. And what could we demonstrate greater than the Word of God operating and effective in our lives? Not because of the what's of faith. We've gone over quite a few of the what's of faith. But really because of the who of faith. And that's basically what we were talking about Sunday, wasn't it? We won't have a confidence in the what of faith, or the how of faith, or the wind of faith, if that confidence is not seated and grounded in the who of faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. The Word of God tells us, looking unto Jesus, looking unto the Word, get a knowledge of the Word. In John's Gospel it says, Jesus came to declare the Father to us. He came to exegete the Father. He came to show us the Father. And he did a very good job of it because we can see the love of God in and through the Son of God that God sacrificed for us. A Son that he loved so much that he'd never been separated from. He said, you're worth it. You know, within ourselves we can get this attitude of we're, we're not worth what God did for us. I mean, that's pretty easy to do. I'm not worth what Jesus died. Hey, let me give you a newsflash. You are worth it. Either, G either you're worth it or God did something stupid. Want that to sink in? So when we get this humble attitude, oh, we're not worth it, what are we saying about God? He was so stupid that he sacrificed his son, killed his son, punished his son for us, and he didn't know we weren't worth it. And so when we look at it from God's perspective, see, this is getting a knowledge of God. God knows things that we don't. In the eyes and hearts of God, you were worth it. And if God says you're worth it, it's a good idea if you adopt the attitude. <laughs> I'm worth it. I might not understand my own worth. Isn't that what the psalmist said in the 8th Psalm? He said, God, when I look at the stars, the heavens, the works of your hand, he says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or that you would come and even visit him? What is man? What are we? Who are we? What kind of container do you make that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. 
I mean, that's hard in our thinking to get 50 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag. Not going to work, is it? <laughs> Something doesn't add up. But in you dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost resides inside of you. You're bigger on the inside than you're on the outside. It says in the book of Ephesians that all the powers, thrones, and principalities in heavenly places are going to know the infinite facets of God's infinite wisdoms with an S. The infinite facets of his infinite wisdoms are going to be revealed to powers, thrones, principalities, and in heavenly places through you. They can look from their heavenly place, they can look at the universe, the created universe, the physical universe, and with all of the things that we see in the physical universe, the expanse, the number of objects innumerable, the number of planets and stars and asteroids and the number of atoms that it takes and the number of electrons it takes to make the atoms and all that God created in its infinite size of greatness and in its infinite size of smallness, nothing that they can see shows them the infinite facets of infinite wisdoms of God. But you do. What is man that you're mindful of him? What am I? The only way we're going to know who we are is if we really learn who he is. And the only way we'll know who he is is to find out who Jesus is. And so this is why in 2 Peter it's so important for us to realize that it's through the knowledge of God. Now think about this. Not just for something, uh, I don't even know the word, esoterical. Not for something just for mind food. Not for something just lightly to muse about. If God's telling the truth, and I believe that he is, he said that we could become a partaker of his divine nature just by getting the knowledge of him. Wait a minute. You can become a partaker of God's divine nature just by getting a knowledge of him. It didn't say by praying. It didn't say by <clears throat> uh, not sinning. It didn't say by tithing. Just by getting a knowledge of him. You start to do the things that he did. You can create with your words. Isn't that his nature? When he wanted something, he created it by speaking. We even went over a little bit Sunday, we hadn't intended, or, or, or how that words created things. We didn't go over this specifically, but we look at what science, we were looking at some of the things that science was showing us about God that are all written about in Hebrews. But you look at little phrases like the lightning of the thunder. And in our thinking, we think the lightning comes first. And then there's thunder. It's thunder first when he spoke it. And that's what produced the lightning. The scientists are still trying to figure out God, and it's all before them, but they want to.
prove themselves to be God. That they don't need any God. Now there are plenty of scientists, Einstein, uh, I think was some fellow named Schroeder and Planck and other physicists at the time of Einstein. They got together and had a meeting to see if they shouldn't change their thinking and realize that there was a God because of things they found in science that just blew their mind. I was sharing with you guys who were here about the electron. To this day, this is what they write about an electron to this day. When they look at an electron, they believe the electron is looking at them. But it goes further than that. This is why it would blow the mind of, of, of scientists and physicists and the great minds that we have. It says, when they look at an electron, now I want you to think in terms of, of uh, something you didn't learn in school. At least I didn't. I was shown a picture of an atom or a drawing of an atom and it had a nucleus and then it had those made up of neutrons and protons in the nucleus and then it had little electrons orbiting around it. Well if you study an electron, an electron is more like a cloud than it is a little solar system. And that's what it's called, an electron cloud. And the reason it's called a cloud is because when they look at it, number one, they don't know, they believe it's looking at them. And number two, they don't know if it's a particle, which is something physical, or a wave, which is something that is an effect more than, it has no physicality to it, like the sound waves you're hearing right now. There's no physicality to it. You can't touch it. The sound waves going through the room right now. If anyone had a radio and they turned it on, <coughs> the radio would pick up the sound waves that are being broadcast from wherever they're being broadcast. Do they start broadcasting when we turn on the radio? No, they're going right now. But we can't see them, we can't perceive them. They're not physical in the way of we think of things being physical. So when they look at the electron, they believe the electron is looking at them. And this is what they say. Listen to this. This is your scientists. When they're looking at the electron, they don't know if it is physical or if it is a wave or if it exists at all. This is our scientists. You have to read this stuff for yourself to believe it. That sounds absurd, doesn't it? They're looking at something they believe is looking at them. And while they're looking at it, they don't know if it's physical or just a force or if it exists at all. Now that would, you could, put, you could have just about years ago, you could lock people up for thinking like that. <laughs> and these are our brilliant people. <clears throat> yeah, they're more so. We know where the truth is. It, it writes about all of that in the book of Hebrews. The word of God is alive. It's alive. Think of what it says. The Word of God is alive. We worship the Word of God. We're here to study the Word of God. The Word of God became flesh. Something that was spiritual became something that was physical. And then it has eyes. Didn't it tell you that in, in Hebrews it's talking about the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing of sun to the joints and the moral, the thoughts of, and, and, and the intents of the heart. And then it talks about him 
with whom we have to do that sees us. This word sees, when you're reading the Bible, we uh, sounds like a churchy saying. The Bible is reading you. When you read the Bible, the I think it was just preached. I don't know of that being in the New Testament. But there in the book of Hebrews, anyone know where that is? The Word of God is alive and sharp. Is that Hebrews 4? 12, 4? I had the 4 part, right? And so you could go teach at these scientific conventions. You could go teach the Word of God and you'd know more about life than all of these physicists and scientists that you were standing before. <clears throat> Soon as my Bible comes up, 412. What does it say about the eyes? For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and the moral, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Read on. Wait, 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 wait. His sight? Thought we were talking about the Word of God. The Word of God can see. <clears throat> That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Ch ch chapter 4, verse 12. <clears throat> the eyes of whom... I thought it started off talking about the Word of God. The Word of God is alive. Isn't that what it says? It can look at you. And you know, this, this, and this is the last time we'll get into some more scripture, but I just want you to know how life... God made this practical. He made all of this available to us. God is omnipresent. Isn't that right? We believe him to be every place at once. That's why you can't draw a picture of God because you could never get outside of God to get a perspective of God so that you could set back, see God over here, and you could draw an outline of him. You can never draw back far enough. You can never get outside of him. That's called being omnipresent. So when we look at God, we know God from the Word of God, who is our Lord and our Savior. And if he's omnipresent, then he gave us evidence of this truth through the physical universe. Now, we believe, and scientists believe, here's another thing, it just blew them right straight out of the water, that nothing no, no two things can occupy one space at a time, right? They say, well, no two things can occupy one space at the same time. Well, what does that have to do with God being omnipresent? Let me give you an example. They take these electrons again. How they do this, church, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I just know that the Word of God explains science. And what the scientists have found, that they can take an electron, and they do this mathematically, an electron, a single one electron, and they can put it in two places at the same time. Got the picture? You have only one of them, but they've got it in two places at the same time. Now, just for illustration purposes, they have discovered that if these two places were from one extreme of the universe to the other extreme of the universe, it wouldn't matter. The time doesn't matter as far as the distance between these two objects, which are really one. Got a picture of that? One here, one here, but it's only one. Now, how do they know it's only one? Because if they tickle this one, this one laughs. They touch this one, this one reacts. 
You say, well, wow, what is that? What could it be? You say, well, it, it travels at the speed of light. No! Light can't get from this side of the universe or this side of the universe instantly. It could take millions of light years for light to travel that distance at the speed of light. This is instantaneous. Omnipresent. 